Good evening. Thank you. My name is Vernon Harper. I am the Interim Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs here at CSU Bakersfield, and I want to welcome you to the 33rd Annual Charles W. Kegley Memorial Lecture featuring Dr. Angela Davis. This lecture series honors, honors the legacy of Dr. Charles Kegley. Applause. <laughs> this series features renowned speakers on, speaking on ethical issues of import to our community, our region, and our world. Past speakers have included the likes of Cornell West, Peter Singer, Tracy Martin, Mira Servino, and many more. <laughs> Applause to many more. And before I welcome up uh, Dr. Burroughs uh, to formally introduce Dr. Davis, I did mention to my parents that I would be meeting Dr. Davis tonight, and they said that they would probably faint. <laughs> and to be quite honest, when she walked past me 30 seconds ago, I almost fainted. <laughs> because you can certainly feel the star power in the room tonight. And so without further ado, I welcome Dr. Burroughs. Thank you so much, Provost Harper. And hello, everybody. Anybody else feeling excited? Yeah. yeah. Me too. So um, on behalf of the Kegley Institute of Ethics, I want to say welcome again to the 33rd Charles W. Kegley Memorial Lecture featuring Dr. Angela Davis. Um, it's on behalf of the Kegley Institute. It's, it's wonderful to see all of you here. Uh, this is why we do the work we do, and particularly having students, faculty, and staff, community and campus members and beyond here with us tonight, and our live stream community. Um, thanks so much for being here. So gatherings like these, which we've now hosted for 33 years, uh, are essential to what we do as an institute. We organize and host this and, and many other events to bring our communities together, to engage in kinship, and across a diversity of backgrounds and perspectives in conversation on important and ethically relevant topics to our region, nation, and world. And before we get started with the conversation tonight, um, I want to say a special thanks to our event sponsors who help make this program and many of our other programs possible. So that's the Kegley family. And Dr. Jackie Kegley right here, of course. So take, stand up, take a bow. Yeah. Yeah. Kern Schools Federal Credit Union. <laughs> Kaiser Permanente and Adventist Health Bakersfield. <laughs> Valley Public Radio. <laughs> the Office of the Provost and the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at CSUB. And of course, thank you to our audience tonight for being here. Um, I want to note, just before I, I get into the, the, the introduction tonight, um, there's, just a, there's a couple ways you can help us kind of continue the programming that we're doing and that we work hard to bring to our campus and community in, in a couple just simple ways. One is you can follow us on social media, uh, on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, that helps us spread the word about what we do. It helps kind of expand our community, so please consider doing that if you are on social media. And you can also make a, a donation uh, that goes directly to supporting events like these tonight and many other events. Uh, on our website, there's a donations tab, and we always, support any, we always appreciate any support um, that community and campus members give us to, to help do this work. So thank you very much. Um, and with that, uh, I'm honored to, uh, tremendously honored to introduce our speaker tonight. So through her activism and scholarship over many decades, 
Dr. Angela Davis has been deeply involved in our nation's quest for social justice. Her work as an educator, both at the university level and in the larger public sphere, has always emphasized the importance of building communities of struggle for economic, racial, and gender justice. Professor Davis's teaching career has taken her to San Francisco State University, Mills College, UC Berkeley, UCLA, and numerous other institutions. She has spent the last 15 years at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she is now Distinguished Professor Emerita of History of Consciousness and of Feminist Studies. Dr. Davis is the author of nine books and has lectured throughout the United States, as well as in Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, and South America. In recent years, a persistent theme of her work, and one on which she will speak tonight, has been the range of social problems associated with incarceration and the generalized criminalization of those communities that are most affected by poverty and racial discrimination. She draws upon her own experience in the early 70s as a person who spent 18 months in jail and on trial after being placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Davis is a founding member of Critical Resistance, a national organization dedicated to the dismantling of the prison industrial complex. Internationally, she's affiliated with Sisters Inside, an abolitionist organization based in Queensland, Australia, that works in solidarity with women in prison. Dr. Davis's talk tonight is titled, Education or Incarceration, Activism in the Prison Industrial Complex. Please join me in giving a warm Bakersfield welcome to Dr. Angela Davis. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here at CSU Bakersfield. You know, these days it's not often that I can say that uh, I'm visiting a campus for the first time. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's actually very interesting. After my trial was over, many years ago in the early 70s, I said, oh, I'll be doing this maybe two or three years, and, and then people will forget, and I'll go back to um, being my anonymous self, doing the work that I love doing. And uh, here we are. Um, how many years later? <laughs> many decades later. But let me thank the Kegley Institute for Ethics for having invited me to um, deliver this year's Charles Kegley Memorial Lecture. I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Jackie uh, Kegler, and um, I think it's wonderful that you, you have this series that uh, allows um, people to make connections uh, between philosophical ideas, ideas, and social transformation. The title of my talk, which you just heard, I, it's gonna be um, revised a bit. Um, uh, Education or Incarceration, Activism and the Prison Industrial Complex. And within the framework of that topic, there are many issues about which I could speak this evening. But I'd like us to focus on the relationship between gender violence and prison abolition. First, because I think we need to think more deeply about all of the cases of sexual assault that have been recently publicized. And second, because we rarely think about 
how we are going to solve the prison crisis in terms that go beyond the reform of the prison system. Uh, whenever there's acknowledgement that there is something um, wrong with our punishment system, um, immediately the response is, we need prison reform. Am I right? And if one looks at the history of the prison system, one sees that precisely it is the history of prison reform. <laughs> and it seems as if we should try to find our way out of this cycle uh, that um, inevitably leads us to prison reform, um, which then leads to bigger, uh, more permanent prisons. Um, so that's why I want to talk about abolition. Third, because I think we rarely think these two uh, issues together. Prison abolition and gender violence. Uh, and of course, within the context of, of, the, uh, of discussing the prison crisis, I do want to um, touch on how it has affected educational systems uh, uh, um, and, and how it is impossible to imagine a solution to the prison crisis without uh, reimagining how our, our whole system of education. Uh, to begin with, uh, sexual assault and sexual harassment are now finally in the spotlight. Am I right? Um, and this is actually a moment when women all over the world are letting their communities know that these forms of violence have been going on too long and that demands are finally on the table. Time is up. This violence, this harassment, this belittling has got to stop. Even those forms that are well-intentioned, as our former vice president uh, <laughs> recently learned. <laughs> Women feel empowered, and many men are glad that the pressure surrounding what we have come to call toxic masculinities are beginning to give. Women are calling for an end to the violence and many men recognize that it is in their interest to join their sisters. Now, I'm going to encourage uh, um, critical thinking at every point. Uh, and so I realize that I've been speaking in categories that are most often associated with ideological assumptions uh, regarding the binary structure of gender. I've been talking about, um, what have I been talking about? <laughs> Women and men, right? But I want, wanted to be clear that when I use the category women, I'm using it in a capacious um, way. I am using it in an inclusive way, meaning, first of all, women of all racial, ethnic, economic backgrounds, but also trans women, black trans women, trans women of color, Latinx trans women. As a matter of fact, it is also time to end the marginalization of trans women. Trans women of color constitute the community that is most consistently targeted by violence, by different modes of violence, by stranger violence as well as family violence, by state violence as well as intimate violence. 
Perhaps if we looked more closely at why trans women of color are so systematically targeted by so many forms of violence, we might better understand the roots of gender violence more broadly. Gender violence is complicated. It has a great deal to do with racism, and it reveals how the ideology of heteropatriarchy has so deeply influenced the way we think about each other in this society. Now, I find it very interesting that whenever we bring up racism or misogyny, there's this tendency toward individualization. I must be talking about some racist white person. <laughs> or I must be talking about some misogynist man. So that these deeply embedded and widespread social modes of marginalization that are responsible for seemingly unshakable hierarchies, for differences in economic status, for social attitudes, they're simply assumed to be traits of individuals. They're assumed to be individual traits and are often wielded as accusations directed toward individuals. Um, Last month, or was it month before last, I was, I was looking at the Michael Cohen hearings. Did any of you? Uh, I actually wasn't planning uh, to look at the, the hearings, but I, I happened to um, um, be watching a news station um, when three really amazing new congresswomen of color uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, or as she is known in New York, AOC, uh, Ayanna Presley, and, Rash and Rashida Tlaib. Um, I um, would, would mention, Olan, um, um, no, no. <laughs> anyway, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but, but let me say that I was, I, I, I happened to turn on uh, the station when they were in the process of, of uh, questioning um, Michael Cohen. And uh, I was particularly struck by the reaction of Republican Congressman Mike Mark Meadows when Rashida Tlaib uh, uh, complained that he had brought out a black woman who used to work for Donald Trump. Uh, I think her name is Lynn Patton. She, he had brought her out to stand behind him as he went on and on about how Trump couldn't possibly be racist because after all, this black woman had worked for him. And now she is in the Department of Housing and Urban Development. The exchange was so typical of the national drama of racism that remains contained within the sphere of individual attitudes and behavior to such an extent that we never get to fully engage with the historical, structural, ideological bases of racism and misogyny. If these huge phenomena that produce so much pain and death for countless numbers of people all over the world are misunderstood as simply correctable defects of individuals, we will never get anywhere. Um, so, um, 
But you know, that is what happened uh, during those hearings. If, 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 uh, those of you who saw it, you, uh, uh, Meadows turned red <laughs> and said, uh, uh, is she calling me a racist? I can't be a racist. Um, I'm friends uh, with uh, Elijah Cummins, the black head of the Oversight Committee. I mean, we've heard that, right? Uh, my best friend. Uh, my best friend is black, or my best friend is uh, um, um, Latino. Or, uh, so it's, it's, it, it, it's so interesting that that is uh, where we usually tend to go because it prevents us from, from understanding the real foundations of racism. There's a reason why I want us to think both about racist violence and misogynist uh, violence, as well as their complicated intersections. We have reached the point, I believe, where we are transitioning within public discourse from a purely individualized notion of racism. Remember, it used to be that people were told to go do an unlearning racism workshop or something like that, uh, and that was the solution. Um, but we are embracing more complex ways of thinking about racism, ways that acknowledge the structural components um, of racism. And also, we should recognize that if we live in this country today, we're all implicated in the continued reproduction of racism, uh, all of us. Uh, I think we're beginning to understand that we are carrying the weight of histories of colonialism, histories of slavery, 500 years since European colonizers set foot in this part of the world claiming to discover America. And you know, people still feel very comfortable saying, uh, Columbus discovered America. Well, first of all, he had no idea where he was anyway. Uh, uh, uh. But this doctrine of discovery erases the fact that there were people living in the American hemisphere long before the Europeans decided they would go out in search of places to conquer. And indigenous history is inextricably connected with black history. There is no black history outside of its connection with indigenous history. You know, um, I think this is the kernel of truth uh, behind um, many uh, black people's assertion that uh, uh, that someone in their family background is, um, is Indian, <laughs> right? <laughs> or oftentimes Cherokee, or I don't know, black folks in the audience, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> and I'm not saying that that's not the case. Um, but in many instances, genealogical research might reveal what Elizabeth Warren found out about <laughs> her background. No. No. But that's not the point. The point is that there were intimate connections. Indigenous people assisted black people to escape and form maroon communities. There were indigenous slaves initially, um, but um, indigenous people could not be enslaved. Uh, there were African slaves. Uh, and I'm not ignoring the fact that some indigenous nations held Africans as slaves. Um, as a matter of fact, um, Theda Perdue 
um, Circe Sturm and Taya Miles are um, um, historians who uh, try to reveal the complexities of, of this uh, relation. When we look at the development of what many of us now call the prison industrial complex, we see dramatic evidence of how histories of slavery are structurally embedded in our punishment system. And moreover, how capitalism, which is always the elephant in the room that nobody <laughs> wants to talk about, right? Uh, that capitalism has always relied on racism and continues to rely on racism. Slavery, let me just um, um, say very briefly that slavery was the very basis of the development of capitalism. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read uh, Karl Marx. Yeah? So if you read Capital, you know about the primitive accumulation of capital, the capital that was necessary to get capitalism going, uh, because wealth was never just naturally concentrated in the hands of some people, neither then nor now. It's always about stolen labor. It's always about stolen labor. Capital is ultimately produced by labor, um, but of course workers are forced to give up the products of their labor, alienated labor. Slaveholders benefited, Jeff Bezos benefited. <laughs> the richest man in the world today. But maybe not tomorrow, <laughs> because I understand that he's getting divorced from his wife. <laughs> so we may have a richest woman in the world. Uh, and I would be critical of uh, assuming that that's necessarily a good thing, uh, because it's just a change in personnel. Uh, the same exploitation continues to happen. Uh. Slavery also produced forms of punishment um, um, based on institutionalized violence, and we see some of those forms still present in the prison system today. The punishment system we have today is linked to slavery through the post-slavery development of the plantation-based convict lease system, and then the southern penitentiary form, um, most of us in encountering histories of the institution of the prison are, 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 are taught that um, uh, it's the, 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 the forms that emerged in, um, in the East, in the Northeast, uh, the, um, Pennsylvania and New York. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I have a spring cold, so I, I may have to uh, cough periodically. Um, but um, I wanted to share with you that Michelle Alexander pointed out in her book uh, that uh, there are more black men in prison uh, and under the control of the punishment system today than there were black men enslaved in the year 1850. And this is important. But it's also equally important in trying to understand how we arrived at this um, crisis of uh, the, the prison system that devoured resources that ought to have been given to um, schools and colleges and universities. Uh, um, in order to understand that, 
we need to know something about the rise of global capitalism. Um, in the 1980s, Deindustrialization. You know, there's a lot of talk about this. Even, um, you know, what's its name? The 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 what is his name? The current occupant of the White House. Uh, <laughs> you know, speaks about this a great deal about um, industries that have um, moved out of the U.S. He doesn't talk about them as having um, migrated. The first immigrants were corporate. So it was during the, the 1980s uh, when uh, corporations began to look elsewhere for cheaper labor, sources of cheap labor. Uh, so we know that in terms of um, a great deal of manufacturing, the maquiladoras uh, 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 arose ar along the border of, 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 of um, Central America. And at the same time, corporations began to, to move to places like Korea and um, Viet South Korea and Vietnam. And, and then, and then at a certain point, many of the major industries that people had depended on for jobs were gone. Look at what happened to Detroit and the auto industry. I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. The uh, fathers of many of my friends worked in the iron ore mines or the steel industry. Uh, there is uh, one steel mill left in Birmingham, and it is a museum. Uh, at the same time that, that this deindustrialization was happening, the rise of, uh, uh, of, of uh, what we uh, now call neoliberal ideology, uh, the um, notion that the individual should be responsible for everything, uh, that, um, that uh, welfare somehow prevents people from finding their inner strength, inner strength that the public good somehow uh, uh, militates against competition so that um, um, what we used to take for granted, that is to say the fact that anyone could go to any hospital and get treated before being asked, what kind of insurance do you have? Can you afford this? Uh, um, it, it only mattered that, that you were ill or that you needed medical care. Nowadays, that's gone. As a matter of fact, young people are probably amazed to uh, know that there used to be a time when you could go literally to any hospital and you would be treated. Uh, well, except for the racism. <laughs> Um, and so during that period, there was, we saw the privatization of, 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 of health care. Uh, we also saw uh, um, the emergence of private prisons. And, and we saw the corporatization of the entire punishment industry so that even those publicly owned prisons reside, uh, relied on the outsourcing to private corporations of all you know food um, health care um, the provision of appliances uh, for for prison for prisoners but the point that 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 I wanted to make here is that a conjuncture, historical conjuncture em emerged when uh, people lost their jobs 
and they couldn't rely on social services because those social services were in, in the process of deteriorating. Uh, and, and so what were they offered instead? Well, there was, there, there was this question, what do you do with people who no longer have jobs and no longer have the prospect of getting a job and no longer have housing and can't get health care, can't get mental health care. What do you do with them? Well, this is precisely the moment when we witness a boom in the prison construction industry, where prisons pop up all over the country. And um, psychiatric institutions are closed down, which is probably a good thing, uh, but there was no alternative. And so today, the three largest psychiatric institutions in the country are county jails. It's like LA County Jail, not that far from here, Cook County Jail, and uh, Rikers. Rikers Island in New York, and people have been trying to shut down Rikers forever. Uh, um, so, so what was happening was that public funds were being transfer, transferred to prisons, uh, build more prisons, make them more repressive, forget about schools, focus on juvenile facilities, forget about the fact that schools are supposed to educate it, that they're supposed to teach children hope, teach them about how to imagine their futures. Focus only on discipline, or primarily on discipline in the schools. Make schools more like prisons so that the schools become literally prep schools for prisons. Right. Teach children, teach children in poor communities, in Latinx communities and black communities, teach them how to be prisoners. Use school to introduce them to metal detectors, uh, school resource officers. And, and so they're being put on a track that leads them directly into prison. That's the, what do they call it? The school to prison pipeline. Uh, um, so, so why is it that we assume that we can rely on a prison system like, th like the one we have to address something as urgent and as complex as gender violence? Um, when we know that these prisons are violent institutions, they are institutionalized violence. Uh, and they're not even designed to make communities safer. Although they serve that ideological purpose. Uh, this is why it's very often very difficult for people to imagine living in a world without prisons. Uh, because uh, people assume that uh, you know, all of the really um, terrible people in the world are behind bars. <laughs> but I can give you a long list. So. <laughs> anyway. But the question I'm asking is, why do we assume that people who commit gender violence should simply be put in prison? Take the case of Larry Nasser. I don't know if you've been following uh, uh, the, the case of this doctor in Michigan uh, uh, who abused the hundreds of young girls, uh, aspiring um, uh, gymnasts, uh, including many of the well-known Olympic um, gymnasts. And he was sentenced to 60 years in federal prison. 
He was then sentenced to 40 to 175 years in a Michigan state prison. And then he was a, a sentenced to an additional 40 to 125 years after he pled guilty to additional counts of, of sexual assault. Now that's absurd, isn't it? If you, add, if you add it all up, I don't know, what does it come to? First of all, there's no way in the world that he can do that time. <laughs> but I think more importantly, it gives you a sense of the absurdity of using prisons to address something as urgent as the need to get rid of sexual abuse. When you simply assume that you're going to relegate someone like, 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 like this person, and you know, I don't even want to argue that, that there's something um, special about him, especially uh, horrendous about him, uh, because we know that this goes on and on and on. And we know that the reason he got away with it was because there was complicity. Because many of the young women for years had been complaining. And then there were those who said, but, but he's a doctor. He's a prominent person. How could he possibly? And then you simply send him to prison. So what I want to suggest is that that's, that's a way of forgetting about the problem we have to solve. And imprisonment produces a kind of amnesia, a kind of amnesia with respect to a whole range of social problems. Uh, uh, because we assume that that's the end of the line. You know, once the perpetrator is sent to prison, then we can forget about it. But in the meantime, first of all, they go into violent institutions. And if they were violent to begin with, they will be even more violent uh, uh, when, when they get out. And, and most people do get out. Most people don't get sentenced to, uh, you know, 500 years like uh, Larry Nasser. Huh? But I mention this case because, um, uh, because gender violence is the most pandemic form of violence in the world. And for the last half century, many people have worked diligently and explicitly to reduce this violence. Uh, all kinds of organizations have emerged, agencies, rape crisis lines, many, women and some men have dedicated their lives to the minimizing and eventual eradication of this violence. Uh, but the overarching framework of this activism has depended on criminalization and on sending the perpetrators uh, to a uh, prison. Um, and what I want to suggest is that that kind of Carceral feminism, um, and you know, there are all kinds of feminisms, right? There's not just one feminism. Uh, and unfortunately, mainstream feminism has also been carceral feminism because it has depended on these processes of criminalization. Uh, 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 which, which also means that we haven't really been able to talk about what it is we need to do in order to extricate ourselves and our societies of, 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 from this of violence. And, you know, one of the, um, one of the points that, 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 that uh, I'd like to make is that these movements have primarily been um, women's movements. And I think it's about time that men took the lead in calling for an end to sexual violence. 
because um, you know those of you who who's, who will identify as um, men. <laughs> And there, there are many ways to identify as men, let me say that. Uh, but um, um, there are ways in which you can begin to produce change that goes far d deeper. Uh, you know, all of these conversations, all of these male-only conversations uh, that, that that, 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 that happen, that uh, I use certain vocabulary and describe, certain vocabularies in describing uh, uh, women. Uh, uh, how many of you, how many of you feel responsible for, for challenging that when no women are looking, when no women are around? <laughs> so how many of you feel that responsibility? Now, this is a real question. <laughs> I want to know. I want to know. Thank you. Thank you. Because that is how it has to happen. And I know that many of you uh, who are opposed to this kind of sexual violence uh, uh, and don't want to be associated with it, but you also don't pull the coattails of those who use the vocabularies that are linked to that kind of institutionalized violence. Uh, so I'm saying that that's one thing that you can start to do right now, as of today. And I think that um, I'm supposed to be winding down now because I've been speaking about 40 minutes, and and um, no, we're, we'll we'll have some um, we'll have a conversation. But I do want to say a few words about <coughs> about the connections we make, about why. Um, about the way in which racism prevents us from understanding how uh, generative uh, the experiences of, of women of color uh, can be. Uh, and they're often considered to be experience that, experiences that only relate to women of color. Uh, um, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking about the fact that uh, there's a long history of anti-violence work, anti-gender violence work associated with the civil rights movement that many people don't know. Many people are not even aware of the fact uh, that Rosa Parks began her activism by organizing on behalf of a woman in, in a place called Abbeville, Alabama in the mid 1940s, 1944 as a matter of fact, who was gang raped by a group of white um, um, men, Ku Klux Klansmen. Were you aware of that? Yeah, I mean, 1944, this is like 11 years before 1955. And most people assume that the only thing that she ever did was to <laughs> refuse to get up, right, and move to the back of the bus. But Rosa Parks was, a, was, a, was an activist. She was an organizer. And as a matter of fact, she created, doing this anti-gender violence work in the context of anti-racism work, she created um, the, she and her, co-organizers created what eventually became the Montgomery um, Improvement um, Association, uh, which was the organization that Dr. King came in and began to be the spokesperson for in the context of the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, 
so, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it's, you know, we usually stop at the surface and don't ask questions. We just, we don't ask, well, why did she refuse to uh, get up? You know, it wasn't because she was tired. Huh? <laughs> Which is what, you know, they used to say she was, she was tired. She had been working all day and she was tired and just didn't feel like getting up. So that she became the accidental uh, heroine of, 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 of civil rights. Uh, but I think that if we, um, if we think about the ways in which that anti-violence work was done then, um, 80 years ago, however long, um, 75 years ago, um, then uh, we might better recognize how important it is to um, think about um, gender violence as institutionalized and thinking about the structural elements of it and not assuming that it's only about a bad man, which is what we tend to do, right? So we, we've just now reached the point where we're able to bring um, the, the structural analysis, institutional analysis into our under, popular understanding of racism, and we need to do the same thing uh, with, uh, um, with misogyny and with mis misogynist uh, violence. But I, I wanted to, to ask questions, you know, why, why the connections we make? Um, why don't we make those connections? Why aren't the connections we make uh, more um, complicated? Uh, uh, why do we assume that something that is related to black women is only going to be relevant to black women? Uh, because when we think the category women, almost inevitably, we think white women, don't we? I mean, that's just the way uh, the logic of our popular discourse uh, is, is set up. And perhaps, perhaps if it had not been assumed that we, have to, that, that we have to work with general categories as opposed to specific, like black or, or, or um, Latinx being specific, right? Um, that, that we might recognize the, the epistemological value, uh, the, the, what we can learn from holding on to the specific and the particular. This is, I think, the lesson that Black Lives Matter the Black Lives Matter movement is trying to impart to us a century and a half after this insight should have animated our history. That is to say, Black Lives Matter, but what we're really saying is that when black lives finally matter, that will mean that all lives matter. You know, the problem is that white is the subject of generalization and universalization. Black, Latinx, indigenous, Asian American always remain at the level of the particular, which uh, uh, cannot be helpful in the production of the category women. If we wish to understand the extent to which racism inflects and also infects the very framework of the forms of lo logic, that dictate how we think, we should think about the other side of the equation of white and universality. And that is um, the fungibility, the exchangeability of individuals, which is at the very heart of racist ideas. Lynching culture relied on fungibility. If you couldn't find one black man or woman, because women were also lynched, then get another. And not too long ago, I was um, reading this article about uh, Le uh, Liam Neeson, and I think he's an amazing actor, and I, l I love his work, but now I don't think I'll ever be able to look at him in, this, in the same way, because he said his friend was assaulted by a black man, and then he went out looking for a black man. 
just looking for, well, I mean, that this fungibility means that racist violence often has a symbolic function as well. It is not simply violence against one individual, but against the entire people. Um, and I was going to talk a little bit about um, surviving R. Kelly. Uh, but maybe during, maybe during the question and answer period. Uh, and I was planning to end on uh, with this notion of abolition feminism. Um, so if we can define feminism in so many different ways, including carceral feminism, including feminism, you know, um, what, what uh, people sometimes now call glass ceiling feminism, uh, what we used to call white bourgeois feminism. Uh, <laughs> I mean, glass ceiling, because if you're already at the top, you know, all you have to do is <laughs> puncture the ceiling. But what happens to those who are at the bottom? Um, and I also, I wanted to conclude uh, by saying something about um, global solidarities. Uh, because in this country, even those of us who uh, are associated uh, uh, with marginalized groups, uh, uh, we somehow think that because we are living in the United States of America, that this is, well maybe not now, uh, with uh, the person who is uh, occupying uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, um, but um, but I, I would like us to think about how this um, uh, conservatism is growing. Uh, it's, you know, it's not just Donald Trump in the US, it's Duterte in the Philippines, it's Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, which was a place that was actually the hope of so many people around the world. Uh, uh, when when the, the Workers' Party was, uh, uh, yeah, and now we have uh, Bolsonaro, and, and who just got elected in Israel? I mean, whose party just got elected? Yeah, uh, what is his name? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I think we have to learn how not to say certain names. <laughs> but Netanyahu, um, uh, and he's he's talking about um, annexing annexing portions of the West Bank, and 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 the West Bank and Gaza are the other small sections of what originally was Palestine that, um, that if, had there ever been a hope for a two-state solution. Uh, but now, um, particularly given the support of Donald Trump, uh, so, you know, we are responsible because we should not have allowed Trump to be elected. And we, we could have prevented, we could have prevented that election. And, and this is having, this is reverberating all over uh, the world. Um, but I don't want to end on, uh, on, on um, a depressing note because <laughs> I think that um, even given what is happening here and in other parts of the world, this is a very exciting um, historical moment. Uh, uh, people are active uh, in ways that we could not have imagined uh, 10 years ago. Uh, uh, we have a vibrant uh, prison abolition movement. I mean, I can tell you that there was, there was a time when I said prison abolition, people looked at me like I was absolutely out of my mind. You know, what do you, but now people are, 
are recognizing that it makes sense to ask the question, not only in this country, but all over the world, you know, what would a society that no longer needs to rely on these violent institutions we call prisons, what would that society look like? So what would, what would the educational system look like? Uh, 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 what access would people have to housing? Uh, you know, wouldn't people also have to have free health care? Yes. Wouldn't people also have to have free education? Yes. And so, let me um, conclude by saying that this is really an exciting moment that is calling upon us to combine our scholarship and our activism with our collective passion and our imagination. Uh, because I think we all want to be able to look forward to a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. So everyone, we have um, 30 minutes for uh, questions and dialogue, and I wanted to say just a few words about that process. Um, we have four student volunteers, I believe, in theory, um, on the sides here, uh, who have handheld microphones. Um, and so if you have a question, um, you can raise your hand, and I'll do my best to, to, get, to get you and get a question from you. Um, I wanted to say two things about this. Um, uh, first of all, I'll just kind of ask it in, in question form, and, and please be concise, because as you can tell, we have a lot of people, and we want to have as many people participate as possible. The only other thing I was going to say is I actually want to start, I want to have, have the first two questions be uh, CSUB undergraduate students. Um, if they are interested in asking those questions. So do I have student volunteers with the microphones here? If you here, raise your hand. Somebody here? Yes, here and on this side? Okay, great, thanks. So we have uh, a question here in the front row and we have a question here. So why don't we uh, pass the microphone over here? Right. Just pass it right over there. You can just hand it to him and he can pass it over. It's fine. I don't think it's like yeah. I'm sitting here. So everybody else can hear you too, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, my name is Alexandria Thomas. I'm with the Black Student Union here. And my question to you, Dr. Davis, is throughout your life, throughout your career, and everything that you've been through, would you do it again? Would you, would you do it again? I'm also coming from a position of being somebody that was priorly incarcerated. So I'm also part of Project Rebound here, Michael Dodson, and along with that. So with Project Rebound, with being a part of the Black Student Union here at CSUB, would you do it again? Well, thank you for your question. And my answer would be absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, you know um, what, what um, may appear to have been a very difficult moment in my life, um, the time that I spent behind bars, um, now when I look back on that period, I see it as a gift. Uh, because had I not been arrested, I would not have um, become so passionately involved in, 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 in these issues, and especially with respect to women in prison. Um, because when I went to jail, I went to jail because I was doing work around prisoners, like political prisoners, uh, 
um, I was, you know, working to, to free the Soledad brothers, Los Siete de la Raza, and, 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 but what was interesting was that none of us talked about the fact that there were women in prison. And so I realized that there were, there were many issues to be um, raised and ways of thinking about the whole system that came from the experiences of women in prison. Uh, so I actually, you know, come to look at that time of my life as a, as a gift. You know, I learned how to, I learned yoga when I was in, <laughs> in jail. And that's something I do to this very day. Uh, so, yeah. Um, you know, many people say, well, you know, what about all the sacrifices you, you made? And I, my response is, I don't feel like I've sacrificed anything because it's been a wonderful life. And, 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 and not just about work, but also about joy and, 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 and pleasure. And I think this is one of the things we have to convey to people who want to become activists. Uh, and that's one of the themes of uh, this evening. That it's important to find something that you really enjoy, something that is fulfilling, something that is going to um, produce some um, pleasure in you, um, as well as allow you to give to others. But thank you so much for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Andrew Davis, I want to thank you for coming today. I appreciate it. We want to thank you. I love you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm, um, I'm a student. I'm an undergraduate. I'm also with Project Rebound. I was in, uh, previously incarcerated. And I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, give an honor to my James White, my professor, Dr. Do uh, Olson, uh, Dr. Uh, Pelosi, uh, what name? Uh, Pal Palosi, you know, uh, Palosi, I can't pronounce the name, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of nervous. I'm gonna ask you a question though, okay? Seriously, okay. Now, there's a theory called the double bind theory that I'm, I learned in, uh, in my classes, and I noticed that women are been bred like in, in the double bind theory, not conscious of it. So are men that's coming out of prison. How do you, what do you think is the best solution how to solve this, bring them aware of this, this theory so they can break away and be free? Because sometimes the inmates get out of jail, but they're still in jail because of their own conditioned mindset. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, um, you know, some people refer to that as like prisonization. Uh, um, uh, and um, I think that, uh, well, first of all, Project Rebound is such an amazing, uh, you know, when I think about John Irwin and, you know, And some people are now just catching up with the idea, uh, like at NYU, uh, um, university colleges and universities are, um, are calling for an end to um, the box, they're banning the box, right? The, the box that, have you ever been, what is it? Have you ever been convicted of a crime? Get rid of that box, both for jobs and for education. Because, you see, it's not just, it's not simply a, um, a psychological defect. It's the way the entire society is organized. It's designed to make people who have spent time in prison feel as if they don't um, deserve to be treated as free human beings. Uh, the fact that we've had to struggle against felony disenfranchisement. Uh, you remember, um, you remember George Bush? 
I mean, George Bush actually sounds good now compared. <laughs> But I remember that if it had not been for felony dis disenfranchisement, he wouldn't have been elected. And so I, I think that it is a responsibility of everyone uh, and all the institutions to rethink and recreate our institutions uh, so that um, people who have done time behind bars not only feel welcome, but they feel as if they have something special to offer. Um, because, you know, you know, imprisonment is a, is a, is a, um, it's a democratic punishment. Because Democracy consists, right, in rights and liberties. And what, what is the, the punishment of imprisonment? It's the denial of rights and liberties. So it's only possible in a society that recognizes that the individual is supposed to um, uh, be a subject of those rights and liberties. Uh, and so it's like the underside of democracy. And I think that uh, people who have had that experience uh, can teach us a great deal about what we need to do to produce a better democracy, uh, produce a democracy um, that... Um, Yeah, yeah, but you know, democracy shouldn't be only about the right to vote. We should have economic democracy. You know, we should, we all, we all think of democracy as only political democracy. Uh, but everybody should have the right to a job, if you want to talk in terms of rights uh, uh, terms. Everybody should have the right to education. Everybody should have the right to health care. Uh, so that's the democracy to come. <laughs> Tracy. Uh, Dr. Davis, first of all, I want to thank you. Part of the reason why I stand here as a professor, I'm Dr. Tracy Salisbury in interdisciplinary studies, is because of you. Yeah. It's because of you. Um, so I'm grateful for that. I'd like you to speak to that gendered violence, and I'm like the actress Issa Rae, I go with the black folks first. So I really am concerned about the black community. Number one, when it comes to gendered violence, believing black women seems to be a problem for us. And that sometimes the disbelief of black women's voices comes from other black women. And then the second part of that is I agree with you 100% that men need to step up to the forefront of this problem, but what do we do um, when they think they're doing the work, but they're not? Um, and where I will tie that to is Nipsey Hussle was, his homecoming was beautiful today, but his partner was subjected to a highly sexualized, offensive commentary from a fellow rapper. And dozens of rappers came forward, male rappers, and I was very proud that they did that. But unfortunately, they did it in proximity to her place to Nipsey. And they didn't see that the violence was directed against Lauren, that it was against her pain, her loss, her body. And, and so I was so disappointed because it was just because they did. They thought they were putting in work. And they just didn't quite, they, didn't see, they still didn't see her. So how, how do we get them there? I think we do it by doing precisely what you have just done now. <laughs> by not being afraid to speak out. But also by um, developing ways of um, communicating uh, that uh, are critical, um, but understanding. Um, 
And, you know, oftentimes uh, we, we act as if lines have to be drawn, right? That you're either on one side of the line or you're on the other. So if um, a rapper comes up with all of this, uh, you know, misogynist stuff about um, women, then, then we uh, put him on the other side. But isn't there a way to have a conversation so that those, those who are willing um, to change? I mean, I had a, I had a really interesting conversation um, uh, with Common. Uh, we know Common's a very different kind of rapper, right? <laughs> uh, but we were talking about R. Kelly. And he was saying that he heard, you know, he heard all of the stuff. And he didn't say anything. And he realized how wrong he was for not speaking up. And, and I, real, I have so much respect for him uh, for being willing to um, um, you know, talk about uh, what he did wrong and the fact that, that he remained silent when he should have spoken out. Uh, I think we have to make it possible for more and more people to do that. Uh, and the, the only way we do it is by um, getting out there and speaking as you do and uh, making it clear that this is, you know, we're, we're trying to go somewhere else. We're not trying to, um, you know, Anita Hill was how many years ago? <laughs> and that's a shame that we should be so much further than we are today, um, but um, we've got to do it. So thank you, thank you so much. For, for you. Thank you. Uh, so we have the young woman in the back here, closest to you in the blue sweatshirt. She's had her hand up for quite some time. How did you stay strong through all the challenges and what advice would you give a young girl like me? Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much uh, for the question. And you know, I don't think that I could have uh, remained strong had it not been for other people. So, what I've always, um, I, I've always um, had the good fortune of being in community. Um, from the time, I grew up in the segregated South and, and I learned about community um, when I was very, very young. Uh, um, but I never assumed that I can do something by myself. And I know that, uh, I know that many people know my name uh, but I see myself as a witness uh, for you know, all of those with whom I've organized and, 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 and worked and, and those people who made it possible for me to do um, what I do. Um, you know, if it hadn't been for huge numbers of people, many of whose names I don't know and will never know, I would have probably ended up spending the rest of my life in, in prison. And so, um, I mean, for example, when I was on trial in San Jose, um, you know San Jose, right? <laughs> but at that particular time, there were hardly any black people in San Jose. Uh, did you know that? <laughs> um, on my jury, there was not a single black person. There was one Chicano man on the jury. And the local organizing that was done around my case was done in the Chicano community. And, 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 and so that was my community there. And I think that, that, that when we think, you know, oftentimes we tend to think of our communities only in terms of, uh, of our uh, racial or you know, ethnic backgrounds and we don't necessarily think in terms of politics um, because there are, I'm telling you, a lot of black people I would not want in my community. <laughs> uh, uh, 
Because I see my community as a community of, of those who want to transform the world. And, and so it's that common vision, you know, a vision of, 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 of a world in which uh, nobody is illegal. In which, you know, racism uh, that has been so um, complicated uh, uh, by Islamophobia. We can't really talk about anti-black racism without also talking about Islamophobia now. <laughs> and, and one of the reasons I've become so involved in Palestinian work is because I think we need, we need to work internationally and and people need to know that the black movement would not be what it is today without the support of Palestinians on the ground in occupied Palestine. Because they were the first to, they were the first to offer solidarity um, uh, for the Ferguson protesters. And they led the way in creating a global um, solidarity movement. Uh, so, you know, all of which is to say, you know, I think that we need to think as broadly as possible about community. And we can't assume that, um, that our comrades and our sisters and brothers are just those whom we know. We have to learn how to um, feel emotional connections uh, with people in other parts of the world who share the same vision of uh, the future as we do. And so that's how I've remained strong. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so I'm going to go to this side of the room here. I'll do uh, the one with the red shirt, please. We need, we need to get it. Can, we, can, you, can you hold on one sec? We'll get you a microphone. Do you? Hi. Good evening. My name is Lori De Leon. I'm Dolores Huerta's daughter. You're Dolores uh, Huerta's yes, daughter. Yeah. <laughs> want to welcome you. <laughs> welcome you to Bakersfield. And um, I also work with the Dolores Huerta Foundation. And I want to thank you for appearing in the documentary on my mother, Dolores, and you spoke about the intersectionality of communities and everything that you're addressing right now. Um, Dr. Davis also addressed that in the documentary, Dolores. And so um, I just want to welcome you. Well, Dolores I mean, has always been my hero. Yes, and, we, and, Absolutely. and you have always been ours, you know, so as well. So, and I just, on behalf of my family, and she yesterday was in Sacramento after traveling for across the country um, over the last 12 days. She hasn't come home yet, but she just celebrated her 89th birthday yesterday and the first Dolores Huerta day. But I also wanted to mention um, to you and also to the folks uh, here in the audience that the Dolores Huerta Foundation works on a lot of the issues that you're talking about. The school to prison pipeline here in, in Kern County, we, you know, we've had you know, one of the largest um, uh, in the past, in 2010, we had over 2,500 kids of color you know, pushed, uh, expelled. That didn't even talk about the suspensions and the push outs, right? And so we, because of our advocacy work in the community, you know, trying to stop that school to prison pipeline, you know, we, um, in the last year, in the, the last school year, we only had 60 expulsions. And that's because of the work of a lot of, of the community that have come together. So activi activism is very important. What I would encourage all the community here to do is learn about the um, LCAP. That's where you know, the funding goes for our schools. And it also encourages you know, the participants of communities to determine what, you know, where that money is getting budgeted. You know, we all voted for that you know, Prop 30 money. So now we have a voice of where a lot of that money goes. And I would encourage all of you to get involved. It isn't, like she said, just about voting, although that is very important, but also we have the census coming 
coming up, and we really need everybody to get out there and help make sure everybody gets counted. But again, thank you for being here. We love you. We've loved you over the years, you know, and uh, welcome to Bakersfield. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank Go right you. Here. Go right here. We have a question right there with the jean jacket. Um, hi, Dr. Davis. Thank you. Um, I heard you in New York and I couldn't ask you, but I run a nonprofit and I'm formerly incarcerated. And I, right now I'm actually writing policy for post-traumatic prison disorder. And when I heard you at Riverside Church, you talked about going to Australia and you talked about the work you do over there. And so you talked about here how people need to actually talk to formerly incarcerated people because you make plans for us, but you cannot make plans for me because you haven't walked in my body. And one of my biggest problems as being a formerly incarcerated African-American woman is that there is no mental health services, incarceration or post-incarceration. And this is why I'm writing policy because I tell people, I'm going to Columbia May the 28th. I pose as normal, I look as normal, but follow me home and deal with my disorder and my trauma from prison. And so as a community, because I know that I have neighbors and I have family and I have friends, but many people don't know how to deal with what I'm talking about. That's why I'm writing policy to actually give it a name and a face because we have disorders that are not being dealt with. And I think for me to ask you, how would you best give me an avenue to help people understand exactly what I'm talking about from a view of a woman who's been to prison because it's not the same as a man. We don't have the resources and we have more mental health challenges. We all have challenges, but we, we have a lot of them. And how would you say is a barrier? Because right now I'm using education as my barrier over all adversities, but, and using Columbia as a platform and Just Leadership USA to help me with policy and legislation. Everybody doesn't even have those tools because until we realize that we have mental issues, we can't even be functional. So were you at the Beyond the Bars conferences? You were at the Beyond the Bars conferences here? Yeah, that's a, that's, um, a really important question. Um, because uh, what, we don't, what we don't acknowledge is that um, actually imprisonment creates mental disorders. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you know, Charles Dickens, right? I'm talking about the, the Charles Dickens <laughs> traveled to the United States in about 1833 to visit the new prisons. And he visited Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. And one of the things he said was that these institutions, because the penitentiary was very new. You know the US created imprisonment, right? And offered it to the world. So this was a time when people from Europe were coming to look at the new prisons, the new penitentiaries. And he says that um, they um, create insanity. Uh, um, and that, that was the case then, and that is the case now. All the, especially when you look at the super maximum security prisons, uh, um, quite a number of researchers have have been able to um, um, do, have been able to do interviews and so forth with people inside and they have come to the conclusion that these institutions create mental illness. Uh, um, so what is the solution? Um, I don't know if I have the answer now because of course we would need to have a, a, a a, a free healthcare system that would provide people with the assistance that they need. Uh, um, but in my experience, what has been really helpful to many people who have spent many years in prison is to become involved 
as activists uh, when they get out. I had a conversation, I know you specifically referring to women, but I had this amazing conversation uh, with Albert Woodfalk and uh, Robert King. Do you know Albert Woodfalk? Okay, well, have you ever heard of the Angola Three? Okay, um, Herman Wallace. Herman Wallace spent 40 years in um, solitary confinement. And he died um, a few weeks after he was released. Albert has been, Albert has, Albert spent 44 years in solitary confinement. Uh, and um, Robert King about 30 years, I think. And what they say is that uh, people look at them and, 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 and say, well, it's really amazing that uh, you were able to experience all of that and, and you're not crazy. <laughs> and he said, but we are. <laughs> you know, you don't know. You don't know the demons that are produced from forcing someone to live under those kinds of circumstances for, for so long. Uh, um, and I, I think that, uh, that we have a lot of work to do, you know, first of all, to legitimize uh, um, psychotherapeutic work, uh, and especially in communities of color, people s are still reluctant to get help uh, uh, when, when they need it. But also to think about um, uh, how the society itself produces these disorders. Racism is a, is a kind of mental illness. Uh, I mean, when you imagine that, that you can make people these white nationalists, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, people did research years and years ago about the ways in which racism uh, it, um, is the foundation of and encourages mental illness. Uh, so um, let me thank you for the work that you're doing. And I think that we collectively have to strive to figure out um, um, not single answers, but uh, uh, you know, multiple responses uh, to these issues. But thank you. So we have time for um, one more question before we need to get Dr. Davis to another event. And we've got the gentleman here with the hat, please. Sir. I want to thank you for coming, Dr. Davis, and I want to, it's not a question, I just want to make a statement. Uh, the statement being that uh, I was privileged to attend a, something like this, but it was outside at UNLV in Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, in the 70s, you were a speaker, and um, you had the big afro, and <laughs> We thought you were so good looking. Uh, but the point I want to make to you is on that day, uh, it was it, 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 during a controversial time, uh, the Vietnam War was going on. And um, I, had, I come from a family where my dad was, he was part of the military complex. So I was going through this the revolt of the black guy. And um, a lot that you said uh, that day was uh, what stuck in my head the most was what you said about women. And um, fortunately, I have been able to become a father of a girl, and that's my only child. But that was really, really intriguing, what you said about the empowerment of the black woman uh, that day. And I thought, you, I thought that was empowering that I saw you on the stage and not a man. So I have done that with my daughter. And I really appreciated the invitation that you gave to all men tonight to, uh, to not promote the degradation of any woman in conversation, either hearing it or not. Because being a father of a daughter and my only child, I figure if you can do that, 
then someone's doing that to her and speaking on her that way. So I would say that I would want to say to everyone that are men uh, of all colors to not engage in those, uh, what you call those derogatory conversations that pump up your feathers on your bedboard, but do nothing to enhance the female. <laughs> Well, you know, um, it's also about recognizing um, women's leadership. And this is a, this is a very important moment. Uh, we're seeing, um, you know, women rising to take leadership uh, in so many different spheres, and especially women of color. And I think we're realizing that, um, first of all, women have been doing the work all along. <laughs> you know, whatever you're talking about, whether you're talking about, um, you know, activist work, organizing work, uh, organizations, uh, Dolores certainly knows that. Uh, uh, the 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 the. the the, the, the whole farm workers movement uh, would not be what it was without the contributions of Dolores Huerta. Si se puede. But all kinds of other institutions. You know, the church. Who does the work? Who always does the work? And what's exciting now is that finally women are demanding to be acknowledged for the work that we've always done. And as, and as, and I, as I was saying before, this is, this is really such an important moment because um, a lot of what was considered to be normal is being challenged. And, and sometimes when, when a sense of normalcy is challenged, people, people um, get, un they feel, uh, you know, uncomfortable. I mean, that's what conservatism is about. It's, conservatism is about wanting to conserve what may, what seems to have worked in the past but it's no longer working. You know, that's what make America great again means. It means look to the past. Uh, and what's exciting now is that so much of what has been considered the basis of normalcy is being um, contested. Uh, even uh, the gender binary that I referred to uh, earlier. I mean, what was more normal than the division of genders into male and female? And, um, and I'm, 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 I'm telling you that uh, uh, many trans women in prison were the ones to point out that Actually, when you work against the prison industrial complex, you also have to work against the policing of gender because prisons police gender by their very nature, male prisons, female prisons, right? And so when you begin to recognize um, what it means to think outside of uh, that framework, uh, that that, that uh, it's not just uh, trans men and trans women, but gender fluid people and uh, beyond the gender binary. And what's interesting is that this is an example of what it means to challenge ideology more broadly. So if we can challenge the gender binary, certainly we ought to be able to challenge racism. You know, certainly we ought to be able to get rid of heteropatriarchy. Uh, and so, 
So this, that, that's what's so exciting for your daughter uh, right now, that she's growing up. How old is she? She's 24. Okay, yeah. <laughs> And, and one of the things that, that I've been saying is that it's a, it's a wonderful time to be young. It's a wonderful time to be young and learning. Uh, but it's also a good time to be old. <laughs> because those of us who are older get to see that the work that we were doing so many decades ago that seemed to not make a difference is finally mattering. That work has reaped fruits. And so you can look forward and say, and, 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 and say that what you do now, you may not immediately see the consequences. You know, maybe not next year or the year after. Uh, but eventually, eventually, uh, the work that you are doing at this very moment will make it possible uh, for um, perhaps another generation to imagine a much more uh, um, emancipatory, um, um, to have a much more emancipatory vision in terms of what the world is going to look like. So thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Dr. Davis.